All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I sent out, um, I guess, what you would call a review for the final. Two of them. No, two. Two, right? Some things that you could start to look at if you wanted to. I'll, re I'll review both of them and see if there's anything missing um, or things that you don't need to worry about. I'll let you know. Um, our, our final is a week from today, right? So you don't have a lot of time to get prepared for it. We'll meet here at 11, we'll go to 145. So, um, but we need to finish the material that we're gonna be tested on. So we're gonna do uh, two, three examples out of 8.6 that I didn't get to. Then we're gonna start the very important 8.7 McLaurin and Taylor series. So without further ado, let's move on. Um, we wanna remember last time what we did is we said, okay, there are certain functions we can represent as power series, so long as we can somehow connect them to this series sum n equals zero to infinity of x to the n, which is one plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus dot, 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 so long as the absolute value of x is less than one, we can do that. So we are very limited in what we can do, but there are, quite a few things we can do. So here we're asked to express the inverse tangent function as a power series. Inverse tangent doesn't look at all like x to the n. Um, oh, and I should say, hold on, that this is equal to one over one minus x. Sorry, I forgot the most important thing. It doesn't, our tangent doesn't look like one over one minus x, but we know this. We know that our tangent of x, right, is the antiderivative of one over one plus x squared dx, right? We know that from this class and from Cal 1, we learned the derivative of our tangent is one over one plus x squared. So there is that relationship, right? And one over one plus x squared is something that kind of looks like this, kind of. So what I'm gonna to have to do is I'm gonna to have to rewrite this as one over one minus negative x squared dx. And then, then I can see that it kind of looks like this. And I think last class I replaced this x with u to try and get you to look at it more generally where the absolute value of u, u is less than one. So, if I can do the antiderivative of this, then I would get what our tangent of x is, right? But this in purple here, I can rewrite that in its series form, right? So I can do integral of, okay, so it's basically the formula up in the top right, but I'm gonna replace u with negative x squared. So this is gonna be the integral of the sum n equals zero to infinity of negative x squared to the n dx. And we kind of have two options in terms of how we want to go about this. Um, we can write it out as a series and then integrate each piece, or we can integrate the summation. It's up to us. I'm gonna do it both ways. I'm gonna show you both ways because I think you should be comfortable with both. So first, let me write it out as a series. This is gonna be equal to, oops, the integral of, okay, let's let n be zero. If n is zero, negative x squared uh, to the zero is just gonna give me one. And then if I plug in n is one, I'm gonna get negative x squared. If I plug in two, Let's see, if I plug in two, I'm gonna square the negative, which means positive, and then squared x squared, which is x to the fourth. Then the next term I plug in three, it'll be a negative this time, but x to the sixth. And then you can kind of see the pattern being established here. Plus dot, 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 dx. Questions? Let me integrate each of those now, okay? So this will be equal to Antiderivative of one is x. Well, you know what? I should put a plus c here, right? And then we do x, then minus one third x cubed, then plus one fifth x to the fifth, 
then minus one at one seventh x to the seventh. I'll do one more plus one ninth x to the ninth plus dot dot dot. That would be the power series for inverse tangent, right? Now, if we do it the other way, where we're not going to write out all the terms, we need to first take that take that negative one, okay, take that negative one and bring it out as, or that negative and bring it out as negative one to the n. And then I'm gonna write this as x to the two n dx. So essentially I applied the n to the, to the negative one here and I applied the n to the x squared. So I multiplied two times n. And now we use the, power rule for antiderivatives. So this should be some constant plus a new sum. And whenever we do antiderivatives, the index does not change. Oh, the only change is when we take derivatives, it goes to one, but for antiderivatives, it stays at zero. The negative one to the end does not get impacted at all because it doesn't have X on it. But now I need the power rule on this piece. So I'm gonna go one over two N plus one x to the 2n plus one. So I'm adding one to the power, but then I'm also having to divide through by one over 2n plus one to kill off the power when I take the derivative. And that should be it. It should be it right here. And we can check it. If we let n be zero, negative one to the zero is gonna be one. Then if I plug zero in for n here, we should just get x, which would match the first term here. When we plug in one, we should get a negative, and then we should get a three here, and we should get an x cubed there. So that should be this term. And then it'll continue. So they match up. What do y'all think? You have any questions about that? Seems good to me. Good. You have to make the connection that the, the inverse tangent is the antiderivative of this. If you don't make that connection, then it's not, you know, you're going to be stuck. Okay, next example. We want to find the antiderivative of one over one plus x to the seventh power using a power series. So what this example illustrates for the first time is how you can take the antiderivative of something that would be very hard to do by hand with power series. So what I did is before class, I went to um, Wolfram Alpha and I asked Wolfram Alpha to find the antiderivative of this. Okay, so here it is. The antiderivative one over one plus x to the seventh dx is this. Whoa, we're never coming up with that by hand, okay? We're never gonna be able to do this. Look at all this stuff in here, sine, log, right? Sines, more logs, secants, logs, tangents, cotangents, cosecants. We don't even have a method for doing this by hand because it's not like trig sub or anything like that. It's not a basic U sub. This would be something that would be extremely difficult for us to do by hand. Do you know what I mean by hand using like a technique of integration? But with power series, we should be able to do it because all we're doing here is the antiderivative one over. And then again, I just look at this as one minus negative X to the seventh dx, right? That's all I want, the antiderivative of that, just rewriting it to look like that form. And that means the antiderivative of the sum, n equals zero to infinity of negative x to the seventh to the n dx. I want the antiderivative of that. Again, I'm going to split I'm going to split the negative one off the front, negative one to the n, and then I'm gonna have x to the, well, I'll just write x to the seven n times x to the seven n dx. So I want the antiderivative of that, which I can just, oh, I'm taking the antiderivative. So c plus sum n equals zero to infinity, keep the index at zero negative one to the n doesn't get impacted, and then power rule.
There we go. Let's write out the first few terms. If n is zero, this will be a one, this will be a one, and it'll be x to the first power. So we just have x. When we plug in one, we'll get a negative because it'll be negative one to the one. And if I plug in one for these ends, I'll get one eighth x to the eighth. And then I'll have a plus on the next one. And if I plug in two, I should get what, 15 on the bottom, one over 15 x to the 15th minus, should we keep going? We'll do one more. Um, three, so if you plug in three there, you'll get a negative here. And then down here, one over 22, <clears throat> x to the 22 plus dot, dot, dot. And I'll go out as far as I need to go in the event that someone wants me to actually evaluate this. Like if they give me limits of integration, I would just have to go out as far as I wanted to. And then remember how we do it, we put a bar here and then we do the two numbers we plug in and subtract. If we needed to, that's what I would do. I'm gonna go back to Wolfram Alpha. I mean, sorry, Wolfram Alpha. Yeah, this is Wolfram Alpha. And um, scroll down, because they probably gave me the antiderivative here like this, but they probably gave it to me as a series as well. Well, they didn't. Hmm, interesting. Alternate forms, maybe there's more. I'm really surprised they didn't give me the series. He doesn't want this. Hmm. Okay, let me do this as a series. Let me see if it'll, oops. As a series. It's not as smart as I want it to be. It's not doing it. Interesting. Okay, so what I could do is I could get rid of the integral. And then just do, this is really slow. What is going on here? Okay, if I just type in the original thing, It should get, what, what, what is, okay, there we go, no, where's the series? Oh, it only gave me a few of these. So what would the antiderivative of these first two be, right? First one would be x, and the next one would be one eighth x to the eighth, which would be the first two things we had, right? Okay, okay that's just to show you that there is a way See, I mean, isn't this pretty clean compared to trying to do that by hand? Just come up with a series for it? Okay. All right, there's one more example I wanna show you before we get into the next section. Uh, there's a problem like this, number 11 in the homework assignment, where they ask you for the, the power series representation of this. So express something like this. This is not number 11, this is number 12. Um, express this as a power series. Well, the problem is it doesn't look like what we need it to look like, right? It doesn't look like one over one minus u, okay? So that we can convert it. But if we do partial fraction decomposition first, right? You remember how we did that? We did partial fraction decomposition before. If you do partial fraction decomposition, which I'm not showing the steps, it turns into these two expressions being subtracted. And what I can do is I can come up with power series for each of those, right? This first one, I could rewrite that as one over negative one plus X. And then minus the other one, I could write it as one uh, plus two X on the bottom, just kind of rearranging some stuff here. On the first one, I can factor a negative out of the bottom and move the negative up to the top. And on the second one, 
I can rewrite this as one minus negative two X. And I'm almost there. This is negative one times one over one minus X minus one over one minus negative two X. And so each of these now looks like what we need it to look like, right? They, they both look like their own version of this where the U's are the yellows. Make sense? So now we can go negative one times sum n equals zero to infinity of, uh, this is just x, and then minus sum n equals zero to infinity, and this one will become negative two x to the n. Questions here? Oh, I forgot the N on this one. Sorry, I forgot the N there. Now we have two series, right? I need, I wanna try and put it into one series. So at this point, watch what I do here. Algebraically, this just becomes sum N equals zero to infinity. I'm gonna move that negative one inside, negative one times X to the N. And then on this one, minus sum, n equals zero to infinity. I'm gonna write that as negative two to the n times x to the n. Notice they both start at the same exact place, right? They both start at zero. They both have an x to the n. So what I'm gonna do here is kind of use this property that like this. If I have some a sub n uh, plus or minus some b sub n like this, if I'm trying to add two series, this becomes sum a sub n plus or minus b sub n. This is true. This is true only if these two converge. So we're, we're assuming that these are convergent series, that the yellow parts, the absolute value of that is less than one, and we need that the absolute value of negative two X is less than one. So long as that's true, then this was valid. This step was valid. So we are assuming these are convergent. So we're allowed to put these together. So I'm gonna put these together into a single sum. And then it's gonna be this formula, minus, cause there's a minus right here then the other formula like that. So all I did was just took this minus this, put it in parentheses in a single sum. And they both have an X to the N, don't they? See, they both have an X to the N, so I can factor out an X to the N. And I'll have negative one minus negative two to the N times X to the N. There we go. That would be your power series. Uh, Lewis, no, what? Uh, I was just thinking, since there's an imaginary negative one there, I remember you like to like throw that inside of the, the N. No, no, it doesn't have the same base. Sorry about that. Wait. If this was a negative two, we could maybe put them together. I was saying um, there's an imaginary negative one, and you could have put that as plus parentheses negative two, close parentheses and minus one, but they don't have the same base, I believe. There's an. So like these two negatives can't come together and become positive. Hmm. I'm not sure no. that that's what you're saying. No, sir. I was saying. Uh, but there's an imaginary negative there, negative one, right? In front of the negative sign, right? And then you could throw that into the N minus one. But I'll, um, I'm, I'm pro I, they probably don't have the same. If this is okay with you, this is okay with you. My bad. Yeah, no, this is, this is fine. What, the only other thing I'd want is to maybe write out some of the terms. So let's let N be zero, okay? If N is zero, Let's see, negative two to the zero, that's one. 
So we have negative one minus one, right? Negative one minus one is negative two. X to the zero, right? We're plugging in zero, so that'd just be negative two. Now let N be one, so I'm gonna say plus. Okay, what happens if N is one? Negative two to the one is negative two. I'll write it out. So we get negative one minus, this will be negative two to the one, that, and then X to the one. That's what would happen if you plug in one for N. Then if you plug in two for N, you're gonna get negative one minus negative two squared X to the second. I'll do one more. Negative one minus negative two to the third, X to the third plus, and it keeps going. Let me clean this up. This is negative two. Okay, this becomes just a one because it's negative one plus two. So that's one X. And then here we square the negative two, it becomes a four. So we have negative one take away four, that's negative five X squared. And then here negative two cubed, that's gonna be negative eight. But then we're doing one minus negative eight, that's one plus eight, that should be seven X cubed and so on and so forth. Making sense? Questions? We should see if, if Wolfram will give us that as a series. What if we do X plus two over two X squared minus X minus one, right? As a series, I think I typed that in right. Yeah. Here we go. Negative two plus X minus five X squared plus seven X cubed, right? That's where we were. Okay. All right, so that's, that's pretty much it for 8.6. If we're given a function, we can convert it to a power series so long as we can somehow make it fit into the one over one minus u and we might have to integrate or differentiate or this one we have to do partial fractions. But I had said last time, we're very limited still like what we can do. So now we're gonna get into 8.7, which is Taylor McLaurin series, where we are going to come up with a way of doing this pretty much for any function that we want, we can convert it. Um, there are some conditions though. It's not, I mean, there are certain functions that we won't be able to do this with, but there's not, uh, I should say that case is rare that we wouldn't be able to easily do it, all right? So I wanna motivate this, this with this idea, okay? So what if, what if we started, started out by just taking some function? I'm gonna start with cosine x, okay? And the question is, is there a power series for this? Is there a power series for this? Now remember, a power series is just a, a series of powers of x, right? It's just a bunch of powers of x. And what we want this series to do is for it to be like really close to what cosine of X is. In fact, we want it to turn into cosine of X eventually if we could go forever, right? So we're, we're trying to approximate cosine with a bunch of powers of X um, and get as, as good of an approximation as we can. So let's just, let's start by thinking about what this power series can look at, look like we know it's infinite, right? It's supposed to go forever, but let's act like it stops, okay? Let's just look at, you know, what if we were trying to take this and approximate it? What if we tried to approximate this with a constant function? I know, I know it a cosine function is not a constant, but let's say we were trying to approximate it with a constant function. Um, 
and let's look at the value x equals zero. So we all we all know what cosine looks like, right? We all know what cosine looks like. Looks like this. And right now, I just want us to focus all of our attention at what's happening at zero, right? At zero, we know the value of we know the value of cosine is one. Do we agree? Cosine of zero is one. Cosine of zero is one. All right, we're gonna try and approximate this function, right? We're gonna try and approximate cosine with a constant function to start. So this thing that we're gonna approximate it with, let's call it, um, I'm gonna call it t. t of x is going to be my approximation function, <clears throat> right? I'm gonna approximate cosine with this capital T function. And I'm telling you, I want it to be a constant function. So let's just call it c. What value of C should I pick if I, if I wanna try and get a constant function to be kind of close to what's happening to the cosine function at zero? Wouldn't we want it to actually have the same value? Like, wouldn't it be nice if it at least they, they had the same value at zero? In other words, if T of zero was equal to cosine of zero, but we know that that's one, right? Which would mean that T of X would have to be the constant one function. So what I'm getting at is this. We know cosine, we know what cosine looks like and at zero, it's one. So if I'm gonna try and approximate it with a, with a flat line, I should let, make that flat line be one because then at least they match at one point, don't they? at least at zero, they both have the same value, okay? Everywhere else, it's all, you know, you know, it doesn't match as well, but at least at zero, they match, okay? That's a shitty approximation, isn't it? Okay, so let's try better. Now let's approximate it with a linear function. I mean, t of x equals ax plus b. Not just a constant, but now I can have a little slope to this line. Well, first thing I need is this. I need when I plug zero into the function, it needs to be the same as what I get when I plug in cosine of zero, which is one, right? Right? Don't we want that? We want this to be true. We want that when you plug zero into this, you should get a one. Well, what does that mean? Plug, plug zero into this. T of zero equals zero um, A times zero. Y is B. So what does that mean? B has to be one, right? Yay, yay, yes, so far. So here's what I can say about T of X so far. I know that the B should be one, so it should look like this, right? That's where we are so far. Right now, I'm trying to approximate, I'm gonna draw you a picture here. I'm trying to approximate cosine X, right? I'm trying to approximate that with a line. The line that I've come up with, I'm gonna call F of X here, is A times X plus B, right? I'm trying to approximate it with a line. And right now I know that B is one, but A can be anything I want it to be, right? A can be anything I want it to be. Right now they both have, at zero, they both pass through the same point, right? They both go through at zero, they both go through that black point, but A can be anything I want it to be. So if, if the functions T and cosine, if they both match at zero, right? You plug zero into both of them, it's spitting out one. The next kind of layer of matching that I could do is to make their derivatives match at zero. Wouldn't it be nice if they both had the same tangent line at zero? This is important. Right now they have the same value, right? They both pass through this black point, but it'd be even better if they both had the same slope, right? At that point. So what I'm gonna do is this, I'm gonna say, okay, I want this to be true, got it. I know what the function is. Now I want 
the derivative at zero to match the derivative of cosine at zero, right? Well, what's the, what's the derivative of the t function? Remember, this is my t function, right? It's so t, it's a plus one. It's just a, no, you have to take derivative of the one also. Oh, right, it's just a then. Yeah. It's just a, right? But we need this to be equal to, well, what's the derivative of cosine at zero? Well, what's the derivative of cosine? It's gonna be your negative sign. Negative sign of zero. Which right? is zero. Which is zero, which means that a must be zero. Zero. So now I have a new, better version of this. T of x should be what? Zero times x plus one, which is back to the constant function we had before, right? Didn't we say if we try and approximate cosine with a constant function, we should just let it be one? And then at least they pass through the same point. Now I said, let's approximate it with a linear function, ax plus b. And we still concluded not only, well, the linear function will not only match at zero, they'll both go through the same point, but now I've forced them to both have the same slope of the tangent line. So if I come back here and I let a be zero, that both of these have the same tangent line, don't they? Both of these have the same slope on that tangent line. Understand? What would be better than a linear function? Step it up, right? Let's go quadratic. Let's go quadratic. Let's try and approximate with a quadratic. So this, I'm done. It's not a very good approximation, we know that. But now let's approximate, let's approximate with a quadratic, which would look like this, ax squared plus bx plus c. The first thing we want is that when we plug zero into this function, it better be equal to cosine of zero, which is one, right? So we want them to both pass through the same point. So t of zero is just c, isn't it? If I plug zero into this, and then we know that that must be equal to one. So here's what I know about t of x so far, the approximation. It should be ax squared plus bx plus one. That's, that's a, a decent approximation, but I still don't know what a and b should be. Understand or no? You plug zero into both of these, you get one. So back to my picture, I'm gonna replace this. Now we're trying to approximate with a quadratic. Okay, um, yeah, okay, so I have a quadratic here, right? And I'm trying to see how can I make this look like cosine? So what we've determined so far is that C should be one, okay? There, so I've got C is one. At least right now, if I change A and B, right? If I change A and B, then I'm gonna change the parabola, but it will always go through that point. They have at least that in common, don't they? So the next thing I want them to have in common is the same tangent line, the same slope of the tangent line. So my next condition is that I want t prime at zero to be equal to the derivative of cosine at zero. All right, can you tell me, uh, well, I'll do it over here. What's t prime of x? Well, t prime of x would be the derivative of this, right? Which would be 2ax plus b, right? That's the derivative. And then don't we already know what the derivative of cosine is at zero? I'm gonna do that over here. Cosine um, at zero, right? Take the derivative, that's, that's gonna be negative sine of zero, which we, we already said was zero, right? So we need this to equal this. This is zero. What's the derivative of t at zero? So if I plug zero into this, what do I get? 
B. B. So B must be zero. So now I have a better approximation of what T is. T should be AX squared plus zero X plus one, which is really AX squared plus one. That's where I am so far. So if I go to my picture and I let B be zero, it's telling me I should use this. We still need to figure out what A should be. See, A will change this, right? So what do you think I'm gonna look at now? I've got, they both match, they both spit out the same value at zero. They both have the same first derivative at zero. So now maybe I should look at the- Integral? No, no. Lewis what? The second derivative. Why don't we make their concavity match, right? I mean, because if I adjust A like that, I'm concave up, but I want them to both be concave down, right? And I want that concavity to be the same on both. So let's match the second derivatives now. Does that make sense? I'm kind of building a function off of the derivative of the other one. So now I want T double prime at zero to be equal to the second derivative at zero of the cosine function. All right, what's, what's T double prime of X? So what's the second derivative? The derivative, um, oh, you know what? Uh, hold on a second, yeah. So what was the derivative? The derivative was this, right? The second derivative yeah. would be what? 2a. 2a, right? And then let's go to the original function. The original function was cosine x, right? If I take the derivative of cosine x, we got negative sine x. And if we take the second derivative of cosine x, we should get negative cosine x, right? And then if we plug zero into that, so let's plug in zero into the second derivative here. What would you get? Negative one? Yeah, negative one. Negative one. And we want 2a, right, which is the second derivative of t at zero to be equal to negative one, which means a would need to be negative one half. So I have my final construction for the function we're approximating. It'll be negative one half x squared plus one. That should be my approximation. Let's do it. Let's go back. Let me replace a with negative 0.5. Damn, that's pretty good. That's pretty damn good. Right? I mean, like close to zero, these are practically the same functions, aren't they? Like I could zoom in all day. I don't think I'm gonna see a gap between those two. Zooming in, zooming in, zooming in. I mean, they are just so close to one another near zero, aren't they? Near zero, they're, they're almost the same function. Now, once you get past, you know, somewhere around here, now you're starting to get a gap. Right? So you know what would be better than a quadratic function to approximate it? A third degree polynomial. And then what we could do is we could make them match at zero. We can make their first derivatives match at zero. We can make their second derivatives match at zero. We can make their third derivatives match at zero. Does that make sense? And then if we wanted even better, we would do a fourth degree polynomial. And we would make their, the function match at zero, the first derivative match at zero, the second, the third, and the fourth derivatives match at zero. What would be better than a fourth degree polynomial, a fifth degree polynomial? What's better than that? Six, right? How far can we go? As far as you want. The key is that you're gonna be, need to be able to take the derivative of the function we're talking about trying to estimate. And cosine, we can take the derivatives all day long, right? It'll just keep cycling through sine and cosine with positives and negatives. Does this make sense? The, the big picture is this. Give me a function, okay? 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an, a polynomial from that function. And I'm going to do it by taking successive derivatives and, and then try and match up to figure out the, the A, the B, the C, the D, whatever of the polynomial and build my function that way. That's the, that's the crux of it all. Do y'all want to do a cubic on this one? Do y'all want to do a cubic? That'd be cool. Yeah, can we see a cubic? You want to do a cubic? Okay, so right now we did a quadratic. I'm going to do this a little bit different now, okay? Now that we kind of get the general idea. I want my, I, I, I'm going to try and do it. I'm going to approximate it with t of x equals a x cubed plus b x squared plus c x plus d. All right. Now let's let's think about what we want. We want t of x. I'm sorry, t at zero to match cosine at zero, right? We want that to be true. Okay? We want them to be the same values. Now I need to know the derivatives of cosine. So I'm gonna put them over here. Here's cosine X, right? That's my original function F. What's the derivative of that? Negative sine X. What's the second derivative of that? Well, negative cosine. Cosine X. What's the third derivative of that? Positive sine positive sine x. And let's just get a fourth derivative just in case to be back to cosine x, right? But we could continue this, right? So we want them to match at zero. So let's plug in zero into this. Plug zero into this, you get d. And that must equal cosine of zero, which is one, right? So that's the first thing we know. Now, we want t prime at zero to equal the derivative of cosine at zero, which would be negative sine at zero. This side is negative, or sorry, it's just zero. And now we need the derivative of this with zero plugged in. So I'm gonna make a little table over here with my t primes. So here's t of x is ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. The first derivative of this is 3ax squared plus 2bx plus c. The second derivative of this is 6ax plus 2b. And the third derivative of this is going to be 6a. So if I want the derivative at 0 to match this, the derivative at 0, what do I get when I plug in uh, 0 into the first derivative? C. C is right. C. So this is C must be this. That's the second thing I wanted. Now I want the second derivative at zero to be equal to, let's see, this second derivative here is negative cosine of zero, which would be negative one. This is coming from this. This one was coming from that. That one was coming from that. So now my second derivative here, if I plug in zero, I need to get negative one. So if I plug zero into this, I get two B must be negative one, which means B is negative a half. So now I know what B is. Finally, I want the third derivative at zero to be equal to, let's see, the third derivative at zero. What's third derivative at zero? Sign it's uh it's zero. It's zero, right? And so the third derivative is six a equals zero, and that means a must be zero. So look, we tried to get a third degree polynomial, didn't we? We tried to get a third degree polynomial, and what did it tell me? What is this telling me? A is zero. B is negative one half, C is zero, and D is one. Isn't that the same quadratic we just had? Yeah, you would need to do another, uh, uh, I guess. A we do. We need to do a fourth degree polynomial. So what it's saying is if we want to approximate cosine and we try and do it with the third degree polynomial, it's telling me no, it won't be good. Go to a second degree polynomial or a fourth degree polynomial. 
Understand? That would basically be consistent for every odd numbered polynomial because you'd end up with a, a sign on your final and it would just go back to the previous. That's right. Mm. For, for cosine, yes. For this cosine, yes. Okay. Do we want to do a fourth or no? No. Uh, I, mostly just want, I, mostly see, I mostly wanted to see the graph clip um, more accurately. Yeah, no, no, look, I have no problem degree. doing it. I have no problem doing it. Let's do a fourth degree. If we do AX to the fourth plus BX cubed plus CX squared plus DX plus E. Okay, that's not the exponential, it's just E. See, the thing is you have to start over each time because your letters are going to be different. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start doing this a little bit more like formally. We have cosine, we have cosine X here. I'm gonna start listing out its derivatives. Okay, so this is gonna be the derivative I'm taking here. Uh, zero derivative first, second, third, fourth. We have negative sine, we have negative cosine, we have sine, and we have cosine. All right, those are the first four derivatives of that. Let's list out the T. So we get a x to the fourth plus b x cubed plus cx squared plus dx plus e. That's the original function. The first derivative is 4a x to the third plus 3b x squared plus 2cx plus d. The second derivative is 12a x squared plus 6bx plus 2c. The third derivative is 24 AX plus 6B. And then finally, 24A will be our fourth derivative. You all following what I'm doing there? Now I'm gonna continue this over here. What do I want, right? What do I want? I want the original function T at zero to be equal to what, cosine? at zero, right? T of zero to be cosine of zero. T of zero plugs zero into this and you get E must equal cosine of zero, which we know is one. So E has to be one. Then I want the second derivative here at zero to be equal to this derivative, negative sine zero, which means that what D has to be, zero. Then I want the third derivative at zero to be equal to negative cosine of zero, which means if I plug zero into this third derivative, I get 2c must equal negative one, which means c is negative one half. That's kind of where we were, right? The, oh shoot, I have the wrong derivative there. Sorry, sorry. This should have been First derivative there, second derivative. Now we're at the third derivative. Third derivative, zero, needs to be equal to sine of zero, which means that 6b must be zero, which means b is zero. That's where we were last time, right? That b was zero. We could not get a third degree polynomial, but now you're fourth degree. So I stop using the primes and I start using numbers now for derivatives. And I want that to be equal to cosine of zero, which means that 24a has to be one, which means a is one over 24. There we go. So our polynomial should look like this. One over 24, x to the fourth. There's no x cubed term, right? There's, because it's zero for B. Then I have minus one half X squared. There's no X term because D is zero. And then I have plus one, which is our E. There it is. That fourth degree polynomial should be a better approximation than the parabola we had. Shall we check? So this was our parabola, right? Which wasn't bad, but now I'm gonna put in this one. 1 over 24, 
x to the fourth minus one half x plus one. Oh, shit. What the, oh, I forgot to square the x. I was like, that's not better. There it is. I'm going to change the color. The green one is better than the blue one. Do you see the blue one? You already have a gap between the two. Do y'all see that? The red one's the correct one. The red one is, wait, which one is cosine? Yeah, the red one is cosine, okay? Do you see how the green one is really close to cosine? Like the blue one's far away, but it's closer, right? It's closer. Now it does eventually kind of diverge away, doesn't it? Like over here, it starts to, the green one starts to split away. But close to zero, we've got it matching up pretty good. But see, we're only on the fourth degree polynomial. We could keep going up and more and more and more, right? So the idea, like overall idea, why am I not in? Log in. There it is. The idea is this, there's our cosine function, right? And what we wanna do is approximate it with the parabola, right? There's a fourth degree, sixth degree, fifth won't work, okay? And we wanna keep going higher and higher degrees. And then as you do this, the higher your power goes, the better it matches and you just go forever because it's, infinite, right? So you just start to create the cosine function. Now I stopped at 20, a 20th degree polynomial is where I stopped. But you can see like, if you zoom in now, I am like, I am on it. Oops, I, I'm basically on it. Now, yeah, eventually I'll start to not be on it out here. But I stopped, I'm only at the 20th degree polynomial. I have an infinite number of degrees to go. So the matter? function, yes, yeah, the function of cosine is basically just an infinite series. An infinite series of even powers of x, right? Because remember all the odds weren't working, right? So cosine of x is actually an infinite series of even powers of x, even powers even power, isn't cosine an even function? College algebra, they call cosine an even function. Guess why they call it an even function? Because it's power series is even powers of, of x. Sine of x is an odd function, right? Guess why? Is it, is it running odd powers of x? And it's That's right. You wanna see, you wanna see sine? Do I have sine? I thought I had sine ready to go. That's right, I have sine somewhere else. Uh, that's E, no, no, there, there's sine, okay, so here's sine X, let me make this a little smaller, there's your sine function, right, and now, what the hell, I gotta evaluate this notebook again, for some reason it's not, there we go, so here's sine, Right now I'm approximating sine with a line, okay? Now watch, watch what happens. I'm approximating it with x, okay? There's the next piece. x cubed over six would be the next piece. See me building it out? Building out the sine function. Notice all of these powers, they're all odd. And it, the reason why is because when you did the derivatives, at some points you'd be getting zeros and that's gonna land on all the evens this time because we're doing sine instead of cosine. All right, so look, look everyone, this is pretty freaking amazing because somebody thought about this, right? Somebody was like, hey, look, I'm trying to approximate, trying to approximate a function, right? I'm trying to approximate this function cosine with a polynomial. So what I'm gonna do is make it match at some point, 
make the derivatives match at that point, make the second derivative match at that point, third derivative, the fourth derivative, fifth, sixth, seventh, all at a single point. So it's, it's, you don't get this for free, okay? The, the infinite polynomial does not come for free. It comes only if you're able to tell me everything about, you have to be able to tell me everything about that function at a single point. Let me say that again. In order for me to create the cosine function with an infinite series, I must know everything about that cosine function at a single point. At zero, I need to know what cosine is. I need to know what the derivative of cosine is, the second derivative, the third derivative, fourth derivative, fifth, sixth, the nth derivative. As long as I know everything about what's happening at a point, I can create the rest of the function. That should blow your mind. All you need to know is everything at a single point and we can build the rest of the function out. It's kind of crazy. All right, I think we should get to the notes. So I do have a very quick question. Yep. So with those, they all at some point, you know, because we aren't going to infinity actually with, with any of our examples, they all at some point are our infinite series diverged from like the cosine function. The original function, correct. So all of those, would there be a way to figure out what that last point where they were still the same was? Well, because it, it was doing that thing where they were going yeah. closer and closer and then you would zoom up and it was like, where is it just riding right along each other? You know, what, here's the thing that you would do. Let's say that I really wanted to know something about what was happening on that cosine function, but further away, right? Mm -hmm. What I would do is shift my power series. Okay. Because you know how we can add or subtract A and it'll move the series left or right? Mm -hmm. We know that it's really like our approximation is really good. Even going to what fourth degree polynomial was really good near zero, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I don't need to go past fourth degree and I'm fine near zero. So all I have to do is just shift it over to where you're interested in. And I still know that the fourth degree is going to be sufficient. I don't need to look at it as, oh, I have to look at zero and how far away am I going to start having problems? Does that make sense? Okay. Just move everything down. Okay. It's a good question. Real good question. Okay. So back it all up. Clear your minds for a second. What we're saying to it, what we're saying about power series is this. Let's say you have a function, right? There's some series that we can represent this function, some power series where you have some constant, right? Plus some some constant in front of x plus some constant in front of x squared plus some constant in front of x cubed plus that 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 and we could do that forever right the only thing that distinguishes sine from cosine or for, the only thing that distinguishes two functions from one another are these numbers the numbers look all power series have powers of x sometimes these numbers are zeros, which would kill off things like odd powers, like we just saw with cosine, they're killed off. But really, at the end of the day, all power series, the only distinguishing thing between them are the numbers in front. That's all. So to tackle this whole idea, what we're going to try and do is see if we can't come up with a formula for that number in front. So this is just as a reminder, when we look at a general power series, this is what a power series looks like, right? Centered at A, where you have these constants, constant, 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 constant. And what we would like to know is, is there a way we can come up with a formula for that constant, all right? Can we come up with a formula for the constant, for the constants? All right. All right. Let's let's see if we can. I'm going to do this by hand. It's best to see this play out. OK, so we're given some function. All right. We don't know what it is, but. Oh, um, we know. 
what f of a is, what f prime of a is, what f double prime of a is. In other words, whatever function is given to us, like when I give you cosine, we knew what cosine of zero was. We knew what the derivative at zero was, the second derivative at zero, the third derivative, right? So imagine that we know all these derivatives, all right? At some point a. Then if we, if we want to try and come up with a power series for it, we know that the power series must look like this. Let's write out the first few of these. Let me go one more. That's our power series. <clears throat> We're assuming we can come up with this power series. We're interested in knowing what these are, right? So let's try and figure out one at a time, okay? Let's try to find F, uh, sorry, try and find C sub zero, okay? All right, I wanna know what this is. I wanna know what C sub zero is. Well, one way I could get C sub zero is to just plug A into this. Do y'all see if I plug A into all of these, they go to zero, right? So if I plug zero, is pl sorry, plug A into this function, plug A in for X, you will get C sub zero, right? That's what you get. And do you know what F of A is? Do you know what this is? Well, I told you, you have to know that, right? You have to know what the function's value is at A. So C sub zero, that first constant will just be the function evaluated at A. Now we've got C sub zero. Now I wanna find C sub one. But here's the issue. I can't plug A in again. Because if I plug in A, I'm gonna kill everything off, right? I'm gonna kill everything off, except the C sub zero. I wanna, I wanna try and find C sub one. So to do this, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to take the derivative of this function. So what is the derivative of, of this thing right here? So what's the derivative of a constant? Zero, right? What's the derivative of this piece? Just be C one. It's just C sub one, right? Because this is one minus zero when you take the derivative. So you just get C sub one plus, now when you take derivative of this, the two comes out, C sub two, X minus A to the first power. Plus, now when you take derivative of the next one, three, C sub three, X minus A squared. Plus now the four comes out, four C sub four, X minus A to the third. And then we'll do one more, five C sub five, X minus A to the fourth plus dot, dot, dot. Okay, why did I take the derivative? What can I do now? Remember, I'm trying to find C sub one. I took the derivative because now look at this. What can I do? Now you can plug in A and get C sub one. That's right, now I can plug in A, right? So if I plug in A, F prime of A is equal to C sub one, right? Because I'm going to have all these go away except for this first one. So look, look everyone, I found what C sub zero is, right? C sub zero is the original function at A. Do I know that? Yes, I'm good to go. Now I'm looking, all right, trying to find C sub one. Do I know what C sub one is? Well, it's the derivative of the function at, at A. Do I know that? Yes, I now have that. So I know what C sub zero is. I, need, I know what C sub one is. With me? Let's get C sub two. If we wanna find C sub two, same thing. We can't just plug it in here because it's right there. We're trying to find C sub two. So I need to kind of do the same thing, right? Why don't we take the derivative again? The second derivative of this function will be the derivative of a constant goes away. Here we get two C sub two 
then the X minus way, A goes away. Now pay attention to the next pieces. Something important is about to happen. Plus the two comes out, right? Two times three is six. I'm not gonna write two, I'm not gonna write six. I'm gonna write two times three C cubed X minus A. Plus now the derivative of this one, the three comes out in front, three times four C sub four, x minus a squared plus the four comes out four times five c sub five x minus a cubed plus dot 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 i've done all of that so that i can get the c sub two by itself now i can plug a in again right and kill off all the other ones so f double prime of a will just be two c sub two I'm trying to solve for C sub two, so I'm gonna to have to divide both sides by two here. So if I wanna know what C sub zero is, it's just the original function at A. If I wanna know what C sub one is, it's just the derivative of the original function at a. If I want to know what c sub two is, it's the derivative of the original, the second derivative of the original function at a divided by two. We're going to go again, okay? There's a pattern we're establishing here. Find c sub three. So I'm going to take the third derivative of the function, which kills this piece off. I'm left with the two times three C sub three. That's the derivative of this. Do you see what happens on this derivative? Two comes out, joins the three and the four. So we have two times three times four, C sub four, X minus A. And then here the three comes out and joins the four and the five. So three times four times five, C sub five, X minus A to the second plus dot, dot, dot. I'm trying to solve for C sub three. So I will plug in A now. Kills everything off, but two times three times C sub three. I'm trying to solve for C sub three. So I'll divide both sides by two times three. Third derivative at A over two times three equals C sub three. Are y'all seeing the pattern? I think so. I think so. Anyone have a question? We are developing the formula. I'm, we are creating the formula right now. We're just going to use it after we get it. Let's see if we could take a guess as to what if we tried to find uh, C sub four. If we did the same thing, took the fourth derivative and did all this stuff, what do you think? What do you think C sub four would come out to be? F fourth prime of A divided by N factorial. The fourth A. derivative, the fourth derivative at A, right? Don't say fourth power because that's two different things, right? It's the fourth derivative at A divided by what? Uh, times three times four. Yeah, two times three times four, right? Now I'm going to throw a one in front of all these. One, one. Let's go back up. One. Let's go back up one more. This would be what? Just one. One? Okay, yeah. and then what about this one? That's also a one, right? C sub zero, we're dividing by one. C sub one, we divide by one. C sub two, we divide by one times two. C sub three, we divide by one times two times three. C sub four, we divide by one times two times three times four. It's in factorial, isn't it? These are factorials, aren't they? These are factorials. In fact, you could say that this was the fourth derivative at A over four factorial, right? That's what that would be. And then this one would be the third derivative at A over three factorial. This one would be the second derivative at A divided by two factorial. Does this, does this work all the way up? This would be the 
first derivative at a over what one factorial and then this one would have to be the zeroth derivative at a zero derivative means don't take the derivative all over but it would have to match wouldn't that have to be zero factorial which is like one zero factorial is one yeah exactly so it works so could we write that as the uh nth derivative of a so let's see if we were to follow if we wanted to know what c sub n was right the nth one out there it should be the nth derivative at a divided by n factorial if the pattern follows which it does because you could keep taking successive derivatives and convince yourself of this That's this crazy. is yeah, this is Taylor's formula. It is a way to figure out the coefficients of the power series. It is a formula for the coefficients. So look, I mean, literally, C sub n has been very just abstract at this point, hasn't it? It's been just an abstract thing. But now we have a concrete formula for what it is. So we can go back up to this generic formula. Let me go to my notes. We can go to the generic formula for um, a power series right there, right? And we can replace that C sub n. We can come here. We can take this formula and we can replace this C sub n with that formula. And when you do that, you get what's known as the Taylor series. All right, it's the Taylor series. So this is in my notes. Okay, now I go through this, I go through the same thing I just did with you. I went through that here in my notes and kind of established the pattern. There's the formula. And that gives you the final Taylor series. If we replace the C sub n with the formula, we get this right there, this right here. That is it. This is a very, very important formula result. All right. If you hand me a function now, so long as I can take derivatives of it and evaluate it at these points, I should be able to come up with the series for it. Now, a Taylor series is basically a power series centered at A, right? A here can be like our shifting left and right. That's what a Taylor series is. It's a very general because you can move this series wherever you want. A Maclaurin series is just a Taylor series with A being fixed at zero. So Taylor is very abstract. A can be anything. If you let A be zero, you're talking about a Maclaurin series. All right, so it's a specific example of a Taylor series. Where, wouldn't that just be zero? And then you would be just having X N, X, X2, X3, X4. Would, would what be zero? Uh, so if I were to have F prime, oh, excuse me, F prime of zero. Yeah, F prime of zero. You don't know what the derivative is because it depends on the function you're looking at. My bad, sorry about that. No, sorry. Also, where do we get A in the first place for a Taylor series? It would be provided. It would be, again, if you're looking to try and approximate a function, but you're further down the number line and you want to make sure your series is close to that, you would you would say, oh, let's move it down 10. So A is 10. Oh, OK. So so it's a it's a horizontal shift. It's all it is is a shift. Yep. Gotcha. OK, so that's not a number that we would acquire from looking at our formula like the radius of convergence or something no no gotcha it's, it's, okay it's, 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 that's yeah, that's what i that's what i was thinking it was going to be something like that and so i was getting a little no. lost okay yeah. gotcha mclaurin is usually good enough from everything we do we can center it at the origin start at the origin unless we have a series that somehow has a very tight window of convergence then we would need to shift so remember mclaurin is is basically taylor with a being zero we're going to do our first example. 
we're going to find the Maclaurin series for e to the x. Why is this thing? I'm going to need to restart my computer. It's acting really weird today. So here we go. This is it. Have you ever wanted to know what the power series is for e to the x? We are going to create it. You haven't wanted, you haven't wanted to know? e to the x is one of those things that's easy to integrate, right? It's easy to integrate and differentiate this. So we've never needed to do anything with this, like get a power series. So let's, let's just create it though, okay? So watch the way I do this, all right? It's Maclaurin, right? It's Maclaurin. So I'm basically gonna be trying to find C sub n here, right? I'm gonna try and find C sub n, which we just defined to be the nth derivative at a over n factorial, right? But here we know that a is what? Zero. Zero because it's Maclaurin. So I want to find this, right? I want to know what the nth derivative at zero over n factorial looks like. So I'm going to literally make a table, okay? I'm going to start out over here. And well, you know what? I'm just going to do it this way. Yeah, I'll do it that way. So here's the derivative. And then here's the function. I'm gonna start building it out. So if I take the zero derivative of this function, I get e to the x, right? If I take the first derivative, well, the good news is the derivative of that is e to the x. If I take the second derivative, again, it's e to the x. Isn't this beautiful? Third derivative is e to the x. Fourth derivative is e to the x. And this continues forever, right? So the nth derivative is just still e to the x. Everything's great. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna figure out what is the derivative of this function or what is, what is, I don't like doing it that way. Let's do it this way. What we wanna do here is plug zero into this, right? Because we wanna know what the nth derivative is at zero. So if we plug in zero, we get e to the zero is one. This one here, we plug in zero, we get e to the zero is one. Why am I plugging in zero? It's because it's Maclaurin, right? Right, that's why I'm plugging in zero here. E to the zero is one, 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 all the way down, right? Never changes, it's always one. So we have this general formula right here. This right here is the nth derivative at zero is always one. Isn't it? The nth derivative is always one. So that makes our life very easy because this formula now becomes one over n factorial. One over n factorial, right? That's the formula for C sub n. So I'm ready to build the I'm ready to build the series now. And I'm what I'm doing is I'm using this, I'm using this fact that all all series, right? All power series look like this. All we needed to do was come up with the formula for this piece. The rest of it looks like that. Well, because we're Maclaurin, A is zero. It's actually this and then this. We just found the formula for this, right? Careful. Right, we're gonna do this right here. So this for us should be sum n equals zero to infinity of, we already know that this is one over n factorial, x to the n. That's it. That's the Maclaurin series for e to the x. So let's write out the first few terms. If we let n be zero, one over zero factorial is one, x to the zero is one. So we get one plus. Now we let n be one, one over um, one factorial is one. So one over one is one, x to the one, it's x plus, now we plug in two. So one over two factorial is two. So 
x squared plus one over, now we do three factorial, right? Three times two. I'm gonna write it as three times two times one. I'll just do three times two, x, time, x to the third. And then the next one is one over four factorial, four times three times two, x to the four. I'm not putting the one, I, I could put four times three times two times one or three times two times one, I'm just leaving the one off. This goes on forever, right? That is your Maclaurin series for e to the x. Let's do another one. Oh, do you believe it? You wanna see it? Here's e to the x in red. Here's our first term, right? We said it's one plus x plus one over two x squared. So I'm gonna start adding these. That's a very bad approximation. Here's one plus x. Here's one plus um, x squared over two. Here's one plus x, one plus x plus x squared over two plus x cubed over six. And as I keep doing this, you can see it's getting better and better. And the more terms I go out, the better it gets. On the left, it's not very good, but I just need to go out further. See, so it's just going to constantly march back and forth and just get better and better and better the further I go. Notice that the powers on this are both even and odd, right? So e to the x is, is considered to be neither odd nor even because it has both. To be even, it has to be strictly even powers. To be odd, it has to be strictly odd powers. If you have a mixture of both, then it's, it's neither. Let me back this up. Let's do cosine, because we've already done cosine, haven't we? Let's do cosine though, let's do it formally. So let's find Maclaurin. For f of x equals cosine x. All right, so what I'm gonna do here, make a little table here. I've got my derivative here. And remember, our goal here is to try and figure out what c sub n is. This is the nth derivative at zero over n factorial. And I'm using zero because it's Maclaurin, right? So I want the derivatives listed here. And then here's our function. So we have no derivative cosine x. Uh, first derivative, negative sine x. Second derivative, negative cosine x. Then we're going to have sine x, cosine x. And doesn't it just repeat now? This keeps repeating. Negative sine x, negative cosine x, sine x, cosine x. Seven, eighth. Now, please pay attention to this part. In the previous example, e to the x, every derivative we took, it was the same, right? So we were able to come up with a very nice formula for it because it was always the same. Our derivatives are not always the same, are they? They are not. So the way I go about this is gonna be different, all right? So pay attention because it's a different method. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to figure out what that what's happening at zero, right? Because it's Maclaurin. So I plug in zero there, I get one. Then I get zero. Then I get negative one. Then I get zero. Then I get one. Then I get negative one. Sorry. Then I get zero. Then I get negative one. Then I get zero. Then I get one. And that pattern just keeps repeating, right? So you know how on the previous one, I came up with a nice formula for C sub n, right? And I just like plugged it in here and I was like, yeah, easy, easy money. This is harder to do now. This one's harder. So I'm gonna watch the way I approach this. I'm not actually gonna try for a formula because it keeps changing on me. So instead what I'm gonna do is I'm going to write out this series piece by piece. We know that the very first, 
the very first um, term, let me go to my notes here. Right, this is our, this is our um, McLaurin right here. The very first piece should be F of zero, right? F of zero for us would be the original function at zero would be one, right? One. Now, the next piece is plus the first derivative at zero over one factorial. Let me copy this. Put this right here. So I'm not doing this because I don't have a nice formula right here. So I'm doing this f of zero, that's here. Now the first derivative at zero for us was what? Zero over one factorial. Plus, now I need the second derivative at zero. The second derivative at zero was negative one over two factorial x squared. Oops, I forgot the x right here. Oops, oops, oops. right here, the zero factorial, or zero over one factorial x, that was this one, that's x squared. Then I have plus, what's the third derivative at zero? Zero, right? Over three factorial x cubed, plus now the fourth derivative at zero, which is one over four factorial x to the fourth. Yes or no? Are y'all getting this? You understand what I'm doing? I think we could predict the next one's gonna be zero, right? And then we'll have um, a minus one over six factorial x to the sixth plus dot, dot, dot. So everywhere I see a zero, these are gone. All the odds are gone, right? We said that that would be the case. I'm gonna rewrite this down here as one minus one over two factorial x squared plus one over four factorial x to the fourth minus one over six factorial x to the sixth. I'll write another one, one over eight factorial x to the eighth plus dot, dot, dot. That's our, that's our power series for, or McLaurin series for um, cosine, right? I would like to see if maybe we could write it in sigma notation. Notice what's happening. We've got even powers of x, don't we? Even powers of x. I can make that happen by doing x to the two n. And if I start at zero, I'm gonna get x to the zero on the first one, which should take care of that first term, x to the zero right there. All of these are, are alternating, aren't they? Aren't we alternating this series? So we need to alternate this series. So negative one, we wanna start it at positive. So what should I put here? There's probably n, right? Because you're starting at zero here. So if I plug in zero into this, I should get a positive on my first one. And then I divide that all by what though? Careful on the bottom. Two, four, six, eight, right? Even numbers. Factorial though, right? Yeah, two in factorial. Two n in parentheses factorial. And will that work at zero? If I plug in zero, I get zero factorial, which would take care of that first one. This is the McLaurin series for cosine. Ricardo, what's going on? Do you have a question? Oh, nothing. I'm just looking at it. Yeah, it looks weird. So just to contrast again, with e to the x, this is the easiest McLaurin series out there because there's no changing. 
No matter what, the derivatives are the same. When you plug zero in, everything's a one. So it's very easy for us to come up with this, this part right here, this part right there in blue. We can come up with it because all these are always one. So we just put one there and we're done. But if they change, you can't do that. It's not as easy to do that. So sometimes what you have to do is actually write out what the series is and then look at it and then go to its sigma notation. So question, what, what, what about like a normal polynomial where like by the time you get to a fourth or fifth derivative, you're burned out and you're just getting zero? So you're saying that you would, you would want to approximate a finite polynomial with an infinite polynomial? Yeah, I'm wondering what, like, could you do it? Absolutely. And you know what you would get? You would get the finite polynomial. Yeah, back. you would do. Oh, okay. Because, yeah, because what would happen is once you got to that certain derivative, everything would be zero and it would kill everything else off. Okay. But it's actually amazing that it works that way. Like That it, is interesting. Like it does, it will create, if you try and turn a finite polynomial to an infinite one, it's going to force you to be finite because the best approximation you could get for a finite polynomial is a finite polynomial. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. You should work it out. Just take a parabola and do it and do this setup and you'll see it. It'll spit the parabola right back out. Yeah. Okay. We have nine minutes. I want to try and get, um, do we want to do, let me see. Do I want to do sign right now? Let me see what's on this. Let's do sign. I think I think we need to do it. So do McLaurin for sign. All right, I'm gonna set up my little table here. Here's my derivative. Here's the function. So the zero derivative is just sine. First derivative is cosine. Second derivative, negative sine. Third derivative, uh, negative cosine. Fourth derivative, back to sine. And now it's just gonna repeat. So sine, cosine, negative sine, negative cosine, then back to sine, cosine, the point is that we're not gonna get any easy, well, there's a pattern, but it's not gonna be easy for us to come up with a formula for C sub n. So let's plug zero in because it's Maclaurin, sine of zero is zero, cosine of zero is one, negative sine of zero is zero, negative cosine of zero is negative one, and then we just keep on getting the same thing. I'm going to use that thing again. I'm going to use this. Since I can't come up with a nice, easy formula for this, I'm just going to go straight to this. So this would be f of 0, which would be our function at 0, which is this one right here at 0 plus now the derivative at one, right? This is, this is f prime of zero right there. This is f of zero. So this would be one over one factorial x plus now the second derivative, that's the second derivative at zero right there. It's gonna be zero over two factorial x squared. And then when you do the third derivative, you get a negative one over three factorial x to the third. When you plug in a fourth derivative, you're gonna get zero over four factorial x to the fourth. And I'll do one more. You get a positive one over five factorial x to the fifth. Dot, 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 keeps going. Everything with zero is gone. 
which means all I have are odds left, right? I have one over one factorial X minus one over three factorial X cubed plus one over five factorial X to the fifth plus dot, dot, dot. This written in sigma notation needs to alternate starting positive. So there's my alternating. I need x to odd powers starting at one. So I do 2n plus one. Remember, this is way back early chapter eight. If I wanna create the powers one, one, three, five, seven, I'm gonna use 2n plus one because n starts at zero. And then on the bottom, these are all factorials. They're also odd numbers starting at one. So I'll do 2n plus one factorial. That's your Maclaurin series for sine. You got questions? Wouldn't that um, negative one be to a n plus one or minus one because it starts as a positive? Well, we're starting the index at zero though. Okay. All right. So if you plug in zero, negative one to the zero would be one. And then when you plug in one, you'd get the negative. All right, I see that. Yeah. Okay. So is this going to be kind of like the norm for Maclaurin is turn it into write out the series being added together and then use um, and then use that to make a formula? It's a mixture of both kinds. I haven't oh, okay. I just haven't had an opportunity to do another. Let's I've got two minutes. Let me set one up. Let's try and do one more. Let's see if we can do. Um, let's do a Taylor series. We haven't done a Taylor. Let's do a Taylor for f of x equals one over x at a equals one. Or you know what, let's make it two to make it more interesting. Taylor, not Taylon, Taylor series. Okay, the only difference between Taylor series and Maclaurin is that instead of plugging in zero for Maclaurin. Here we're going to plug in two because we're given a is two. So we still have to make a table for the derivative. Derivative function. All right, things are going to get weird. The original function is one over x, right? That's the original function. I would like for us to write that as x to the negative one. That way when we start taking derivatives, it'll be easier. The first derivative is negative x to the negative two, which is negative one over x squared. The second derivative is positive two x to the negative three, which is two over x cubed. Are y'all following me on these derivatives? Third derivative should be negative six, right? x to the negative four, negative, I'm not gonna write negative six, watch. Negative two times three, x to the negative four. This is negative two times three over x to the fourth. I didn't do negative six because I think I'm gonna start seeing a pattern here. Do you see how the next time down, we're gonna get a four down there with the two and the three? It's gonna start looking really factorial-ish, if that's a word. Fourth derivative, I'm going to get a positive two times three times four, x to the negative five. This is gonna be two times three times four over x to the fifth. Fifth derivative is gonna be back to a negative, two times three times four times five, x to the negative six, which is negative two times three times four times five, x to the sixth. Okay, I think I see the pattern. Do y'all see the pattern there? I know I'm out of time, but now we gotta plug in two for x, right? Two for x. This is one half. 
Okay, the next one is going to be negative one over two squared. The next one's going to be two over two cubed. The next one is negative two times three over two to the fourth. The next one's two times three times four over two to the fifth. And then the last one is negative two times three times four times five over two to the sixth. The question is, can you come up with the formula for the nth one? I know I'm out of time. You gotta go, you gotta go. So what do you think? Does it alternate? Think, look at the signs. Oh, positive yeah, it three. alternates. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Make it alternate starting with positive. Uh, negative one to the end. To the end. Okay, that should do that. Now, what about the numerators? What are the numerators? One, one, two, two times three, two times three times four, two times three times four times two five. It's uh, in factorial. In factorial, right? Whatever n we're at, five, that's the factorial on top. So this should be n factorial on the top over, right? Over what? Isn't that two to the n plus one? It's two to the n plus one. It's always one more power than what derivative we're on. This is what the nth derivative at two is, right? That's what the nth derivative at two looks like. So Hunter's question was, will it always be that we write them out and then come up with a formula? No, sometimes you can come up with the formula first. I need to finish this off. I'm going to write the series out now. My series, and be extremely careful because when you look at the um, series, remember all we did, all we did just now was came up with a formula for the derivative. In other words, we, all we have found is this piece. We have to divide that by n factorial still. Students will miss that part. So our sum should look like this. Sum n equals zero to infinity. We have the formula we just got, which was negative one to the n, n factorial over two to the n plus one. But now we need to divide all that by n factorial. That's this piece. And then do x minus two to the n. That's just that A replaced with two. That is the Taylor series for that. And we would cancel these factorials. Okay, I, I can't go any further, I apologize. Um, what I would do right now in terms of homework, I don't know if you've seen enough. You can try it. I'm gonna do more examples, but um, you can try and do anything five through, yeah, you know, you can try them. Things are gonna get messy. Um, five through 16, go mess with those. See if, don't do anything past 16 though. I don't think I've shown you enough, but to get you through everything there. But if you do my solution videos kind of as you do it, I think it'll all kind of make sense. Okay, we still have more to do in this section. There's more I want to talk about. There's more to talk about. And uh, so, yeah, we're going to take it all the way to the end here. So y'all have a good day. You too. Thank you, sir. Have a good one.